OK, and that's a recording started. And I do mean lectures, because if you check your um, syllabus, you'll see that this week we're actually doing two things. We've got mass storage structures and implementing file systems. Both this week. So I'm actually not even going to do them in that order. I'm going to do them the other way about um, because the way that the, the the storage is set up, I think is quite relevant about how we implement the file system. So I'm going to swap them around and I'm going to do mass storage structures first, even though that's down as chapter 12. OK, so we'll do chapter 12 and we'll take a break and then we'll do chapter 11. Fair enough. I see we're about 20 people short in the lecture, mind you. Wonder where everybody's got to. OK, so the first thing I want to talk about is mass storage systems. It's going to be one of those days with my computer, isn't it? There we go. OK, so we want to look at all the different types of mass storage that we have available to us. We also want to look at how they're set up and how that affects how we connect them, how we uh, format them, how we manage the stuff on there. Um, so what we want to do, of course, is make the best use of these devices. So as I say pretty much every week, we'll look at different ways we can implement things and we'll try and understand why you might use some more than others and what their advantages and disadvantages are, including things like disk scheduling algorithms. And even at this distance, I know that as soon as I say the word algorithm, there's a bunch of you kind of Good, but it's fine. It just means how we're going to approach it. So what structures are we talking about? The main one, the one that you're familiar with and the one that's still most common, is a hard disk or a magnetic disk, as it talks about there. Again, your reminder that anything that's in blue is fair game for getting asked about. So make sure that um, if there's something there in blue that you know what it means and what it is. Most of you have seen hard disks and most of you will probably have uh, an understanding of how a hard disk works. In case you haven't, <laughs> oh good, it's one of those ones where you have to watch the ad. This is going to be here for eternity. OK, so if you've never seen inside a hard disk, most of you have seen a physical box with the hard disk there. What you might not know is that that box is actually uh, vacuum sealed. And the reason that they do that is the stuff inside them is um, so finely tuned and the heads, the reed heads are so close to the disk that they're actually closer than a speck of dust. So unless when you're creating the hard disk, you set it up so that you extract all the dust in there and everything in there, what you'll get is bits of dust getting in between 
for the physical disk and the read write head. And well, the technical term is it will go bang. So what he's doing here and opening it up is probably a very bad idea and you shouldn't do it at home. I do remember nearly 30 years ago, I was running a, something called a Netware a network server. Uh, the disk died, so my network was dead. I did have a backup, but I didn't have a hard disk because it was 30 years ago and they were really expensive. So I had to order one. And while I was waiting for it to come in, I did exactly this, opened up the disk, and what you can see there is a platter. So that's the actual disk. And that's the read write head. So that moves in and out across the disk to read the data that's on that disk. From the sounds that my disk was making, the read write head was stuck. So in order to get my network running, I did what he's done, opened up the disk, flicked the read write head to get it past its initial reluctance to move, and then it ran and it ran like that with a hard disk open and hanging out of the server for a week. And just to be clear, I really do not recommend that. When it is connected, that's what you'll see. So if you missed that, that's the disk head, disk read write head moving across the hard disk and that's it reading the data that's actually on there. And one of the things we're going to look at today is how it knows where to go, how far into the disk it goes. That disk's rotating, you can't actually see it because it's going so fast, it just looks as if it's sitting there, but it's actually rotating. And if you ever look at the outside of a hard disk, it will have the RPMs on it, something like 5600 revolutions per minute, 7200 revolutions per minute. And of course, the faster it goes, the faster you can access the data. So that's what it looks like inside if you haven't seen it before. And what you're seeing there is just a, a single disk. You're seeing the one at the top and a single read write head at the top. If we zoom in, hopefully you can just about see. See how that looks like a blur below the top head? That's actually because there's lots of read write heads and there's not one disk. There's a set of platters. So there's a set of them stuck one on top of the other. And I'm well aware that for most of the people in this class, this analogy will be of a uh, no use whatsoever, but way back when record players used to play more than one song at a time. And they did that by stacking them one above the other. And it was time for the next one to play. The next single would drop down and you'd get your next song. Hi guys, this is purely for um OK, so you'd have a read write head reading that single. When the single was finished, the next one would drop down and read the head. Hard disks are similar, except we don't just have one read write head. We've got as many as you need for the number of platters that you have. So quick virtual hands up for anybody that remembers any of these, this type of record player. Nobody. I thought you guys were all about the um, the vintage stuff. I thought you were all buying vinyl these days. Finally, my hundreds of LPs and singles are coming back into fashion. 
my grandparents have one. Get lost, Ben. Just get just just get lost. My grandparents have one. You know how to hurt somebody, don't you? You really do. Okay, so that's the disc itself. They rotate and transfer data to the computer over a wire. And you can imagine that as those things are moving, there's some things that affect how long it takes to get to the data. And there's different names for uh, what those are. So when you saw the disk move in and out, so when you saw the read head move in and out, so when you saw it go that way across the disk, that's called the positioning time. Because what you have with your disk when they're formatted is a bunch of concentric rings and they are called cylinders. So the read right head moves into the correct cylinder on the disk. So that's one part of it, moving to the right cylinder. Sometimes they're called tracks. Either cylinders or tracks will do thing. Then the time that it takes that takes to do that is called the seek time, and then the time for the disk to rotate and get to the bit that you want to read. Now remember what's happening here, the disk just continually rotates. It doesn't rotate to get to the bit and then read it, just, it just rotates all the time. So it's a time taken to get to the bit that you want is the rotational latency. Sometimes you're lucky, you move in and the, it's just there. And sometimes you've got to wait for a full rotation. So on average, you've got half of the rotation time to wait till you get to the one that you want. That's why disks that have a faster RPM are faster at getting data because you get to the data more quickly and that's why they're more expensive as well. And as I said, if the read right head touches the disk, that's really not a good idea. Remember what these things are. This is basically some iron filings. So it's some grated iron glued to a disc and magnetized. You probably all did that when you were at school. Remember you had the, maybe you would have a magnet and one side's positive and one side's negative and some would attract and some would repel. That's in essence what you've got here. A whole bunch of iron filings, all of which are acting as their own magnets and they can be either positively or negatively charged. And some of you will be ahead of me here. Depending on whether it's positive or negative, will depend whether it's a zero or a one. So we're using the idea that magnets have two different ends to simulate binary. So all those wee iron filings, all those wee mini magnets are all glued to the disc. And as you can imagine, if that read right head hits the disc and takes off the iron filing, you lose data. That's a head crash and it is bad. And these things go so close to the disc, as I said, even a speck of dust is too big to fit between them. So these things work in a vacuum. As you know, we can remove some disks and we have different types of connector. I'm not going to go through them all. You can go through yourself. Uh, they're all there, all different connector buses. And we also have some other hardware called a host controller to actually connect to the disk controller. Because the disk isn't just the disk and the read write heads, there's some electronics here. We controller to say, Oh, you want track six and you want to get to cylinder 18. There's some electronics in there to cope with that, and that's called the disc controller. And the host controller 
allows you to connect multiple disks. And some of you might have multiple disks attached to your machines. OK, so that's the hard disk. That's how it looks in a big exploded diagram. And the next slide is kind of out of date. Um, I don't know the last time I saw a 30 gigabyte disk. I mean, I've got one in an old machine somewhere. I've got an old server that's got a three gigabyte disk. Uh, can't remember where I've put it. But that would run the whole uh, server for a, a whole company on a three gig disk. Um, but the definitions are reasonable. So you've got transfer rates, effective transfer rates, how long, seek time, all that kind of stuff. Talking about how fast, in essence, you can get data off a disk. And that's what we want. We want our data as quickly as possible because the disk is the choke point. It's much slower to take anything off a disk than it is to get it from memory. And we can actually work out the numbers because it's the access, uh, sorry, it's the average seek time. So that's moving the disk read, right head in and out and the average latency, how long it takes to rotate, gives you the access latency or the average access time. And we can work it out because we know how long it takes and different disks have different numbers against them. We can also then work out how long it takes us to transfer some data because we know how quickly we can read uh, the data off the disk. We know how long it takes to get to that data and we know how long it takes for the controller overhead to actually send stuff in and out. And there's an example there for a, a disk where each of the blocks on the disk, and we'll talk about how we're setting them up, but there's tracks and sectors, each of which makes a block. And if that block is 4K, so you're reading 4K at a time and the disk's rotating at 7200 revolutions per minute and it takes an average of five milliseconds to get in and out. And your bus can transfer data at one gigabit per second. But remember, how do we know? Capital B, byte lowercase b bit, so a four kilobyte block, one gigabit transfer rate. And you've got controller overhead. We can add all these things together and give us how long it will take to get 4K of data from this disk, roughly 10 milliseconds, which sounds fast, but not compared to memory. I mean, it is much faster than it used to be. There's a disk getting loaded onto a plane, not the computer, not anything else, just the disk. And the stuff that we were talking about, all those platters that we saw, you can actually see them there. That cylinder is lots of platters for an original IBM hard disk, which held a Massive five megabytes. It had 50 platters, so those things that you're seeing there, there's 50 of those, and they were two feet across, 60 centimeters ish. And it took one second to get to them. So we're getting faster. I can't remember how much this disc cost at the time in the 1950s, but it was stupidly expensive. I do remember the first hard disc that I bought to go along with an original IBM PC. So this would have been in the 1980s. And the PC that I had came with, because I bought the expensive one, came with two, count them, two 
five and a quarter inch floppy disks, each of which stored a massive 360 kilobytes of data. So it looks like that. Um, we were running out of data, so I had to buy a 20 mega, uh, sorry, yes, 20 megabyte hard disk. It was exactly the same size as the system box that you see there. And it cost me two and a half thousand pounds. And it sat on top of the system box between the box and the monitor. Two and a half thousand pounds for 20 megabytes. And when I say I bought it, I see I bought it because I was working for them at the time. So things have moved on. It won't be quite that expensive now, nor will it be quite as small. I'd be disappointed to find a USB drive that was that small. So disks have been getting faster. Their capacity has been getting higher. Um, but there are certain limitations. You can only spin a disk so fast. You can only physically move a, a read write head in at a certain rate. So a lot of you will have an SSD stuck in your machine in state. Um, and it's basically just memory, memory with a controller. Um, Non-volatile memory, of course, like a, a USB drive. So um, much faster because it's memory, but much more expensive. Um, the machine that I'm working on just now is a is a Surface Pro 4, possibly, with an SSD, and it's got 256 gigabytes of an SSD in there. And I think when this machine first came out, it was about 900 pounds which for a jump top iPad is, is quite expensive. We've talked before about mag tape. You can go and look at one of the previous videos if you don't believe me that mag tape is still important. And it's important because it can store humongous amounts of data for an incredibly low price. Would you pay for that? You pay the price of slow access. And that's that's the trinity. You have got speed, you have got capacity, and you have got price. So you pick two. If you want high speed and high capacity, well, the price is going to be pretty good, pretty high. If you want high capacity and low price, then the speed's going to be slow, like a mag tape. OK, so you just don't get all three things. You don't get low price, high capacity, high speed. Pick two. OK, we'll concentrate on hard disks. Um, so hard disks, as you probably know, have to be formatted. Most of you will have done that. Hopefully you did the uh, installation of Linux six, seven weeks ago. And even though that was a virtual hard disk, at least I hope it was a virtual hard disk and you didn't um, overwrite your existing machine, one of the things you had to do with that virtual hard disk was format it. And you format it into blocks, chunks of data. When we were looking at the speed earlier, we said 4K chunks, and that's reasonable. But it will depend on the size of the hard disk. It will depend on the type of data that you want to store. It will depend on the usage of your machine, how the operating system sees that, all sorts of things. In any case, you still have to format it to set up those logical blocks on the media. So 
It's not rocket science. You have a circular disk. So you split it up into tracks or cylinders, concentric circles. And I think we can all be impressed with my freehand drawing there. You wouldn't know that that wasn't a circle. They're so perfect. So you have tracks or cylinders there, and then you split them up into sectors. And each one of these things is then a block. One of the things you'll notice there, of course, is that that block is physically much bigger than that block. That's done for speed reasons. If you have, um, it's about rotation speed, so clearly You've got an outside part of it and an inside part of it. It's all rotating at the same time. If you want to have the same speed, you have to change the disk rotation time. There are some operating systems that do that. They format it differently and they work it differently. The original Apple II did that in order to uh, maximize space on the disk. But in general, it's just quicker to uh, spin the disk at a constant speed and live with the fact that in essence you're wasting physical space. In part because even though I've drawn it like this, these days sectors are more like this. So there's lots and lots of them. So it's less of an issue. So we have tracks, they're numbered, we have sectors, they're numbered, and that creates these blocks, and we number them as well, and we give that a logical number. So a sector or block zero is the first sector on the first track of the outermost cylinder. And then you just keep going, zero, one, two, three, four, all the way to the middle. These things, of course, have to be attached to your computer. So we have a host. Again, some of you who have opened up your machine will have seen that. Uh, you've seen the wires coming from the disk going to, well, in the old days, it would be a, a specific expansion card. It would be a specific um, circuit board that contained the disk host circuitry. More likely nowadays, it's part of the motherboard. In either case, the, there's a physical connection with a, uh, with a wire. That then goes to the controller. And that connects to all these different disks that you may have. And I know this is quite an old computer, but weirdly it makes it easier to understand what's going on. So your computer won't be like this. Old computers had lots of expansion slots. The disks would have connections. These red and black ones are the power connections. You've still got that. But these ribbon connectors are for data and they're connected in this case to the motherboard. And there's a controller in there to allow you to access these physically different types of disk. And you can see that they're physically different there. 
So we have an I.O. port, an input output port talking to an input output bus, and that's the bit where the data is transferred, and that's the physical manifestation of that was that grey cable. So on the circuit board, you just see lots of lines, but that actually comes out to this ribbon cable. And that's a physical manifestation of the I.O. bus going to one of the devices. They're not connected here, somebody's taken them off so that you can see it a bit more clearly what's going on. And we have different ways of doing that, different physical ways of setting up a host. So ISA was an original one, EISA for extended. We've got SCSI to set up multiple devices and they're still used in a, a lot of high-end systems. Um, one of the nice things about setting it up like that is that it's the host controller that decides how you connect to the hardware and taking into account all its physical differences. And that means that you have a line somewhere where you go, well, this is how the operating system's thinking about it, and this is how it's physically stored which means that you can connect lots of different things. It means you can connect your hard disk and your SSD and your USB and your CD and your DVD and your, well, network connections. They've called it a storage area network. You call it your OneDrive. All of these things are presented in the same way, even though they are physically different and connected in a very different way. So we can have fiber have I managed to go backwards? It's impressive. So we can have a fibre channel connected to lots of storage devices. And of course, fibre is optical. It's very fast. Same as you get fibre coming into your house, you get a better internet connection than you do if you've got a cable, a copper cable. And you can connect an array of disks, different types of disk. Or you can connect disk ser servers, which have lots of disks connected to them. And it doesn't have to be disks. It could be tapes, or it could be SSDs, or it could be anything. You can start to build up your storage using all of these different techniques. So you can come up with a huge amount of storage, depending on what your organization needs for what it's doing. And you can connect different things to it, like, as I said, tapes or disks or whatever. So you can have multiple types of storage arrays for different things. They all be connected to fast fiber switches. So the data is sent through and you'll be able to access all of those from anywhere you are. So that's storage area networks where you've got a physical device that connects to your storage. So you've got a storage area network where you connect your devices. But actually over here, we've got a local area network or a wide area network, and we've got things connected to that. There would be nothing stopping us connecting the storage directly to the server, for example. And that's called a network attached storage. I've got that in my house. I've got a box connected to my router that does all my backups. So I've got a network attached storage attached to my, attached to my router. I've got a machine here and every so often my machine backs up to the network attached storage. That just means I've got a physically different backup. Of course, there has to be some software behind that. There's different protocols like NFS and CIFS and that kind of stuff. All to allow us to connect all this data either locally at the client, specifically using a storage area network where you've got a whole bunch of hardware to support it, or using a network attached storage 
so that we can just connect it over our existing network. So there's lots and lots of ways that we can have mass storage structures connected. The, no matter how you've connected them, clearly you want your disk to go as fast as possible. And we've talked a wee bit about that, how fast it rotates, how fast the right head moves in and out. But one of the things we want to do is minimise that. We want to minimise how often we have to rotate the disk. We want to minimise how often we move the head in and out. So what we want to do is look at some uh, approaches that we can do so that we can up the bandwidth up the amount of data that we're sending from our disk. So before we look at those scheduling, has anybody get any questions on any of the, the basic stuff just now? I have a question. So when we have a I can hear that you're speaking, but you're really muffled. Is there a way you can speak up? Have you gone? Can you hear me better right now? Or? Okay. It's really quiet. I'll, I'll try in here. Hang on, I'm just going to turn up my speakers just to. Give that a go. You there? Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Whoa! <laughs> I wish I hadn't turned up my speakers now. <laughs> Oh dear. Wow, they are good speakers. I didn't realise. Thank you. Yes, we'll put it in the chat. Uh, what I'll do then first, give us is I'll move on just now while you're typing that up and then I'll come back to it um, when the whole question is in there. OK, oh, OK, OK, sure. Oh, now I can hear you. Ah, OK. So basically, when we have an old hard drive, uh, uh -huh. the, the data that it's saved you know, on the outer circle, it's quicker accessible than the data which are in the middle. No. Well, Be because no, because it depends where you start. So the, the video that we were looking at, um, this is resting mode. So when the, the disk's not being accessed, the hard disk read write heads are way over here okay they're out of the way of the disk but when the disk is actually being read the read head moves in and out OK, it moves to the particular track that it needs. What that means is, on average, the read right head's in the middle, so the average time it will be... Um, all, all the same. All the same. Because, okay. yes, you're right, if it starts over here and has to go there, then that's quick. And if it starts over here and has to go right to the middle, that's slow. But on average, it's on the disk and it's moving in the middle. So all kind of averages out. So yes and no, I think, is the, the answer. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so, excuse me a second. Thank you. You sure you don't want to come on camera? Say hello to everybody. No? 
Thank you. Thank you. Who knew our hider so well trained? Cheers. Okay, so let's talk exactly about that. Let's talk about what happens when you have to go and get data from the disk. Um, now remember what I said before, we've set up the disk and we've given them logical numbers. Um, so we want particular blocks from the disk and they could be anywhere on the disk. So here we've got a, a queue, a pile of blocks that we need to get from the disk. And we've also got where the head is starting, and that's what I mean, Paris gave us, it's not always stuck way out. It's got to start somewhere, and quite often that somewhere will be the last thing that you read. In this particular case, it was at 53. You also quite often have multiple um, requests from multiple processes, multiple users, depending on your setup. So it's quite often that you'll have multiple requests, even if that's because the file itself is split over the disk. We'll talk a little bit more about that afterwards. In either case, the head is at a particular point. We have data that we want to get. So let's look at what happens if we just take it in the order. So we're back to our good old first come, first served. So it's at 53 and we want to get to 58. So we start at 53. It goes to 98. Then it goes to 183 and then back to 37. And it's jumping about all over the place. So it's going here and then it's going all the way out here, only to come all the way back here, only to come all the way out here. When looking at it, you'd think, well, actually, there's a few ones there. There's a few ones round about here. And this one's all on its own up there. Can we make this better? Than just first come first served. Can we look at this queue and think, well, knowing where we are and what we need, can we calculate how far away uh, a request is and use that instead? Well, of course we can. It's called shortest seek time first. So using the same set of requests and using the same start place, we can say instead of starting at 53 and jumping out to 98, we'll start at 53 and, oh well, look, there's one at 65 and there's one at 67. And if we take off 65 and 67, the next closest is 37 and then 14 and then 98, 122, 124. So we are speeding up how we access these things. So rather than jumping back and forth, we are taking a more measured route through the disk. So shortest seek time first can help with that. But we're still doing a wee bit of back and forth. What would happen if instead of going back and forth, we just said, no, OK, stuff this. Let's just work our way through and keep working our way through, picking up requests as we get there. That's called a scan algorithm. It's kind of like a lift. The lift just goes up and down. And if you happen to be at the floor when the lift is there, great, you get on. But if not, you have to wait for it to go all the way down, all the way back up and all the way to get to you again. And that's what we've got here. Scan just says, no, we're going that way. And then we go all the way along that way to get all the things that we want. So again, less jerking and it's faster.
Um, maybe we can make that a wee bit better as well. So I've said you have to wait for the lift to go all the way down, all the way back up and all the way down for you to get on. Well, it's not exactly like a lift because you could grab if all you needed to do was get on the lift and you didn't care if you went up or down, you could get on no matter which way it was going. In the same way, we don't care what way the, the head's going, we just want to grab the data. So rather than going one way, can we go both ways? So can we move from one to the other and do a circular? Uh, sorry, I've explained that entirely the other way about. This one bounces to the start, to the end, to the start, to the end. Maybe if we just always go one way, if we always go start to the end and then quickly go to the start again and then work our way through, maybe that will give us a better response time. So it looks more like this. So we work our way through, zoom back to the beginning and then start again. That's quite fair as well. We're not saying, oh no, we're, we're not going to do this one because something else was closer. We're just saying, no, we'll go through. And if you happen to be on the list, great. And if not, you'll need to wait. And that's a, a, a fairer way of doing it. Um, on the other hand, what's the point of going to the end if there isn't anything there? So we can look ahead. So we can do something called see look, where if we get to the end one that's requested, we don't work to the end. What's the point? Similarly, when it zooms back to the beginning, we don't go all the way back to the beginning. We go to the first one that we need. So we are compressing where we look. So that's about five different algorithms, and um, they all have the positives and negatives, we have to choose one. Um, depending on the type of data, depending on how it's stored, and we'll look at different ways that we can store it on the disk, different algorithms give different results. So what we are talking about is in general here. And in general, Shorter seek time first or look is usually the best. One of, the, one of those is usually the best to use. OK, we're happy with that. If you go and look in the book, there's some calculations that prove this to you. I've taken out the calculations just because, well, if you're interested, go read them. But otherwise, just trust me. The other thing we need to do is manage the disk. So we're back to what I was talking about earlier when we're talking about formatting. So whenever we get a new disk, we have to format it. Uh, divide it up into those sectors with our tracks and cylinders so that we've got um, blocks of data that we can access. Now, usually those blocks of data are not quite the same size because we have some error correction information in there. And again, if you think back to last year's computer science module, you remember error correcting. Codes. Um, but different disks work in different ways. So first of all, we need to do a low level format to set it up. Then we need to decide how we're going to set up our disk. And again, we talked before about splitting disks into multiple partitions, multiple logical partitions to treat them as separate entities. And then once we have those separate entities, 
we have to say what type of file system we want on there. So that's the logical formatting. So we've got the physical formatting of the disk and then the logical formatting to put on the file system that we want. And you'll remember that we talked about different file systems that are available. Different operating systems might use them, different um, case uh, different cases might use different operating systems to give better efficiency for different types of data, different types of user balance, different types of process balance, whatever it happens to be. So low level physical formatting, then partition, and then logical formatting to create clusters on your disk. Then we need something because quite often our mass storage device is also where we store our operating system. We will want to set up somewhere on disk for that to, to live. And that goes into something called uh, a boot block. And you've probably heard the, the phrase bootstrap when a, a computer starts up, drags itself up by its own bootstraps. So it bootstraps with some code that's held in ROM, so that will be the BIOS. The BIOS will start up, it will check for what's around, and it will look for a disk with an operating system on it and move uh, the program counter to that bootstrap loader on the disk. So you can either start up your operating system or in some cases start up a choice of operating systems if you've got multiple ones installed on your disk. Windows, for example, that's called the master boot record. So it contains some boot code, it contains information about where your partitions are, and then it can point to where you want to start up. The other thing that you're going to put onto your mass storage, and again, we spoke about that before when we were talking about virtual memory, is your swap space. Now remember I said that, that was a big file on your disk, so we have to put that on there somewhere. And we have to decide how it's going on there. Is it one big file that we do from the start and never changes? Is it one big file that we put in the start but we can change? Is it lots of smaller files that are linked together? Do we keep it on the same disk or do we put it on a different partition so that it's not um, so that it's not the performance isn't um, affected by what we're doing elsewhere? We've got all these choices to make. And different operating systems use have different choices. On Windows, it's on the main partition on the main disk. On Unix on the slide there, it works differently. We also have to decide what we want to do if we run out of swap space. Most of you won't have come across it these days because most of you running Windows or Mac, there's a setting in there that says, do you want the operating system to manage the swap space? And you've all said, yep, that's fine by me. But actually, you can manage it yourself. You can decide how much space to have. You can decide where it goes. And you can decide what happens when you run out of space. Do you move things about in the disk to make your file bigger? Do you put it somewhere else on the disk? Do you extend the swap areas? It's entirely up to you. Not entirely, because of course the operating system has to support it as well. The final mass storage device I want to look at is something called RAID a redundant array of inexpensive disks. It's really expensive to make our disks bigger. So it can, for example, be more expensive to create one, let's call it eight terabytes, one eight terabyte disk, than it is to produce two, four terabyte disks. Similarly, it's probably more expensive to produce four two terabyte disks, a two four terabyte disks, than it is to produce four two 
terabyte disks. So why don't we make use of that idea? Why don't we take all those smaller disks, stick them in a box and pretend that they're one big disk? We have an array of inexpensive disks. We can treat them however we want. We can treat them as one big disk. We can split them and have half of them being our main disk and half of them being a backup. So we basically save the data to two physical places each time. My own network in here has that. That's what my network attached storage is. It's got two slots for disks and I've just got two disks in there and the disk is written to both of them. So if one of them goes bang, I can replace it. We, th those are different RAID levels. So RAID 0 is one big disk, RAID 1 is the split. But we can also have other things. We can have it so that we have error correcting disks. So we can have one disk that is just there to um, sort out the error correction. So that if something goes wrong with one of the disks, we can actually do something called hot swap. So we have 10 disks. If one of them dies, we go to the disk that's dead. There's enough redundant data on all the other nine disks that the, the mass storage device can still work. It can still send out data. We pop out the device that's died, pop in a new one, and the RAID structure sorts out rebuilding that disk and using it. So RAID's really helpful, and in the fact that it uses cheap disks means it's incredibly popular as well. All disks fail. So if we have multiple disks and use them in concert, it means that the mean time to failure increases. Because even if you have a failure, you can replace it and you can keep going. So it's more reliable. It takes time to get to data on a disk, but what if that data is on multiple disks? What if you're trying to get to it on three different disks at a time? Well, probably your data will come in three times as fast. Not exactly, but it will be faster because you're instructing the read heads to go to three different places rather than doing those algorithm things that we just did to try and get to three different places on one disk. So it speeds up uh, access times. It's quick to repair and we have a less data loss because data is automatically replicated through a RAID array. And we can actually work out what that means for us. And there's one on the slide there. So this is RAID where we have two disks and they're just mirrored. You write them both at the same time. Uh, a disk might fail after 130,000 hours and it might take 10 hours to repair. We can, if we have two disks, each with those specs and put them into a RAID array, it means that we will have one failure where we can't get anything back every 57,000 years. And the good thing about that is you won't be around for anybody to blame you if it goes wrong. So we've got different ways of approaching RAID. Mirror them, stripe them, put them in different uh, spare disks so that if something goes wrong, you don't even have to replace one. It automatically falls over and puts a nice red light up saying, oh, we've got a broken disk here. Replace this, but we're OK just now. So lots and lots of different ways to approach. Anybody get any questions about that? Oh, happy. All right. Well, that's been uh, over an hour. We do have another lecture to do, so you can't go away. But on the other hand, I will give you a break. So.